So first, I, I want to acknowledge that we are meeting uh, an unsurrendered, unceded, unconquered Algonquin territory that is without treaty. And may we action honest and sincere reconciliation between Indigenous nations and settler governance. Um, I also want to acknowledge that uh, thanks to the tremendous ongoing efforts of uh, Dr. Peter Stockdale, who is with us today, that this is uh, our participation in the Ottawa Peace Festival. And mm. the last time I checked, it was the largest, longest, not largest, longest peace festival in the world. <laughs> uh, um, so this is the relaunch of the National Capital Peace Council. I'm grateful for you guys for joining us because now, now I can see uh, who came for the free breakfast and who didn't. Uh, <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, it's been a challenging time. It continues to be a challenging time. Mm -hmm. uh, but but as, as as Peter may recall, as he sat around our uh, humble table for uh, Christmas last, and uh, in our apartment building, and I managed to arrange for a, a fire alarm at, in the middle of the meal to evacuate the building, <laughs> uh, that uh, we discussed uh, William Commander's. Ramola, uh, let me address the issue of vision because uh, in our introduction, or our invitation, we said hope. You may recall that at the first um, Pine Lodge roundtable discussion on this topic, um, an indigenous friend of mine, uh, of ours, who is also a lawyer, uh, latched on to the word vision um, and interpreted it in such a way as to really uh, cause us difficulty to have a discussion on the topic. Uh, and so I've shied away from the world, the word vision, simply because it's possible for people who, who may know of uh, Grandfather Commander's work, but really don't want to wander it in the way that you do and that we try. Um, as an excuse, the word vision. So I seized on hope. Um, and, and hope is, is always worth seizing upon. Um, so at that, uh, at that Christmas dinner, I, I thought to myself, wow, what's going on? Somebody's trying to tell me something, at least, if not the others around the table. And I thought, uh, because we were discussing uh, yeah. grandfather's. Um, plan uh, for uh, Victoria Island, and I thought maybe maybe now's the time. Pe several people have asked, uh, Ian, why are we referring to this topic at this point? And this is the first time, one, I've had the opportunity because I had other guest speakers lined up early this year, and two, the courage, because um, I've, I've been very reluctant to, to host this kind of meeting. It's the first time I've done it. Um, and so I'm grateful again to Peter and the Ottawa Peace Festival for prompting us into action. So having said far too much uh, by way of introduction, uh, it's, uh, I'm very grateful to Ramoa for accepting the invitation uh, to speak to us. Um, our numbers are growing by the second and um, Ramola Tumbadu, uh, by the way, Ramola, your attachment wouldn't open up, so I'm, I'm reading from your, uh, the body of your text. Um, as a PhD in geography and as uh, a postdoctorate research fellow um, at, uh, from Carleton University, I believe, and I, I know that she'll correct all my fumblings um, when she gets the microphone, but she is, is known to us uh, for her legacy work of indigenous elder uh, William Commander, 
uh, Commanda, Order of Canada. And, uh, but she has also done significant work uh, for uh, Director Fraser Taylor at, um, at Carleton University at uh, Geometrics and uh, Cartographic Research Center. And I have a question for you about the geography of Ottawa uh, sometime later on, Ramoa. But uh, so we all know Ramoa, and we're very, very grateful that she's offered to bring to us once again uh, Elder William Commander's hope, vision, plan for Victoria Island. Ramoa, take it over. Now I'm going to mute everybody else. So, Ramoa, after we mute everybody, you have to unmute yourself, bottom left hand corner, okay? Okay. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. That's, that's working. Okay, thank you, Danielle, for inviting me to join you this morning. And it's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to see so many of the faces that I recall over the years, uh, faces that have been linked with various parts of uh, uh, grandfather's work over the years. And uh, Mm. Uh, let me just start by saying, yes, that word hope, I kind of kind of like it for a couple of reasons. One uh, is that my great grandfather was uh, uh, Herbert uh, Hope Trevor. So I guess uh, some ancestral thread is, is swinging in the title of this presentation today. But as some of you may also recall, uh, I've talked about the Shaudia Falls as the Pandora's box that opened up all sorts of magic to the, um, the ancient people uh, for thousands of years. Uh, we'd go, go so far as to say at least 10,000 years, but over recent historical times, it's become uh, uh, a magnet for a lot of uh, uh, development of ideas and things like that. Some of them have, as with the Pandora's box, been challenging things that have emerged. And um, when everything was emptied off the box, all that was left in the end was hope. So uh, perhaps that's a good way for us to start this uh, presentation today, that note. Uh, so Daniel, we never really did talk about what exactly you want uh, of me today. I do have a PowerPoint presentation that I would be inclined to screen share with you. And uh, I know you're recording this. And so I'd like to know when, uh, how it gets used, you know, in the future so that uh, um, this, this uh, body of information that belongs to grandfather's archives and legacy uh, uh, acknowledged and respected as such. Uh, uh, so um, my angel is telling me, uh, can you hear me, Ramoa? Yeah, I can. My angel is telling me that uh, there is a... I do know it, the screen share button? Yeah, yeah. I'm... Okay, so what I have is, is basically I, a, a presentation that Grandfather Commander and I prepared about 2008. And it's, it's what we used to call in the old days our uh, bilingual presentation, but it's actually really our image presentation so that we would uh, be able to reach people who spoke French, English, and Algonquin really through the, the images. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll share that with you because that really is the hope in the context of the, uh, the vision for the uh, Asanabka sacred site in the heart of the country. And then uh, I'll be happy to respond to questions and, and things like that. Uh, there are 38 slides, so I'm just actually going to uh, let the slides do their work and uh, try not to intervene too much, but sometimes that is a challenge. 
that with you and I want to do a slideshow. And uh, um, can you tell me now that you can see this okay? Yes. Okay, so it's the indigenous vision for a special sacred site within the heart of the country and uh, presented by uh, Elder William Commander. And as you'll see uh, on the right, there's the image of the birch bark uh, uh, etching of the vision. Okay, so let me see. It's not letting me sh share. Let me see. Here we go. So it comes from our notion that spirit is everywhere. And this is a, a, a watercolor painting from the artwork of Bev Doolittle. She uh, no longer sells her books. So really, uh, we wouldn't want this PowerPoint presentation shared uh, without us specifically knowing about it because we've incorporated her art to create and share some of these messages. So the idea there, then, if you can see that uh, clearly, is the notion of the images, the spirit of people, nature, on the land. In this Bev uh, Doolittle image, you see the, the idea of spirit guarding the land. And uh, in this particular uh, image, you see the reflection of the eagle flying over the land and into the water, but really the eagle in snow. And with the, a, a bigger screen, you'd also notice the, the movement of the horses. So it's also uh, an image of journey. Wolf spirit teaches us to walk softly and Wolf, of course, was one of Grandfather Commander's special energy supporters. This one is a painting of uh, Turtle Island by an indigenous person. It's a, a part of the original myths of the creation of Turtle Island. And we use this uh, in, in our, our teachings from the early 2000s to show how indigenous peoples imagined that what we were sitting on here in the continent of North America was turtle. And if you look at North America today, this is how we call it, North America. And in the, the map image, you see the, the representation of image of turtle. Uh, Grandfather and I chose every one of the images in uh, this PowerPoint presentation. We went through many historical books and, and uh, journals that, that we had. And this is one that shows the trading route of the ancient people. So when he talks about uh, being uh, one of 84 nations, the Algonquian people who traversed the continent, taking really their language in various dialects, uh, from the east to the west, uh, you see in this map the crisscrossing of the, the travels of the ancient people traveling freely across Turtle Island. He was able to speak to people across the country in his language. He went uh, to the Shumash people in California, Baja California coast, and was able to talk to them in Algonquin. And so uh, uh, was like an affirmation, a confirmation of the movement of his people uh, reflected in the language. So the birch bark canoe and the nomad were the, the symbol of the movement across the waterways of Turtle Island. And the waterways then served as the highways of the people. So unlike what we have right now with the Ottawa River serving to divide the people, in the, the ancient past, this um, movement was actually the way people traversed the continent. 
and they created the iconic birch bark canoes and grandfather commander as you know was a, a, a preeminent uh, birch bark canoe maker and here he is with his daughter Evelyn showing how the tradition continued over the cent centuries. Uh, together with that uh, movement uh, across the land was also a, a huge respect for animal relations. And you probably will all recall um, the, the song about muskrat love. Uh, the attitude was revering and not controlling nature. And here's a script by a Pueblo uh, 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 elder talking about that huge deep respect for land and nature. And when the newcomers arrived, uh, uh, one of our texts tells us a little bit about their initial impressions of the indigenous peoples. Now, many of these uh, people were French, and so they used the term, um, oh, well, maybe I won't even go into it because I don't have it in the slide. I probably eliminated it. Okay, so their first impressions of the native people of North America was one, in their language, they call themselves the whole house, as though they were one family. And there you see the significance of grandfather's uh, constant prayer, Gina we Daganuk, that we're all connected, that we're all interrelated. Uh, that uh, uh, underlying philosophy of indigenous peoples was recognized right from the very beginning. And, oh yes, I do have the word here, the savage, knows not how to obey. So there you see that the, the word savage was not intended necessarily as a, a racist description. It was the, the terminology for the wild people. But the, the, the context of the statement is actually very respectful in terms of understanding that he must be begged rather than commanded. Fathers would not dare to give orders to their sons. So it talks about the relationship of uh, negotiating discussions. These captainesses are women of quality among the savages who have voting rights in councils. And most of us are, are, are quite aware of Canada's own history of, of women, uh, of women who came from other parts of the world and have only since the 1929 acquired rights and status. But with indigenous women, uh, they were an equal part of their communities and their societies, and they had an equal voice on how their societies evolved. And finally, they call their beads strung together as collars. They use them to treat for peace, to make their embassies, to make their positions, and to convey their thoughts. And that, of course, likens uh, the 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 mechanism for communications with the grandfather. Commander Wampum Belt and Heritage. The land they, they, they asserted belonged to Great Mystery. And Great Mystery was a concept that was larger than a notion of a God. So in, in that sense, uh, Great Mystery is not parallel uh, to a religion. It's, uh, it's a, a deeper understanding of, of uh, uh, the evolutionary forces of, uh, of the cosmic earth. A mighty Pontiac was the legendary leader of Algonquin ancestry and he fought fiercely for the land. So um, he was uh, one of the leaders that grandfather admired and referenced a lot. And he, um, uh, after the, the battle of the French and the English, in the 1760s, it was Pontiac who pushed the English back from each of the 14 forts that they occupied in the eastern part of the country. So he was really fighting for uh, indigenous place on their land. He was actually uh, killed by an indigenous person who was set up in fact by the British to kill him. And so that notion of betrayal is also part of the history of the struggle of indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. But what was important about the uh, uh, Pontiac's battles in 1760 
was that it obliged the British Crown to develop the Royal Proclamation. And the Royal Proclamation included many, many pages of provisions for relationships with indigenous peoples, though a part of it was uh, focused on negotiating the relationship between the original settlers, the British and the French. The British had, had uh, won the war against the French and were negotiating how to move forward in the dominion of Canada. But uh, uh, because of the clout of the indigenous peoples, the proclamation actually is dedicated to resolving relationships with, with these people. And, uh, and the primary uh, uh, significance is the recognition that indigenous peoples were sovereign peoples in their land. So the, 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 the Royal Proclamation of 1763 is always uh, extremely important uh, for indigenous peoples. And it was actually signed on the 7th of October. So we're approaching an anniversary of that commitment of, of uh, relationship. Uh, another important uh, 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 leader of Algonquian ancestry, a Shawnee, was Te Kamse. And he worked hard to unite the native tribes to resist the American takeover of native lands. He was unsuccessful, but acknowledged as a founder of Canada. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the history of Turtle Island, of the Americas. And uh, around this period, uh, the American colonists were rebelling against their mother government in England. And uh, in, in, in this process, there were multiple battles that Britain was fighting. And uh, Tecumseh engaged in some of that because he saw the American um, colonial force taking over more and more of indigenous lands. And he thought alliance with the British would help curb some of that. But at a certain point, he uh, discovered that that relationship was not something that he could trust. And um, it's very interesting um, to me that grandfather talked about a picture in a National Geographic magazine from 1935, which showed Tecumseh taking off the British uh, army uniform, folding it, putting it down, sitting on the earth and putting on his buckskins and returning really to the challenge on his own. And I actually found that uh, magazine and it was in fact dated 1935 and grandfather knew exactly what he was talking about. So when I say he was a historian par excellence, he did really know many, many details about the history of his people and his country. Um, a history that perhaps many younger folk don't really, really uh, comprehend in its depth. With that uh, period came the exploitation of indigenous peoples and the energy of commodification entered the, the relationships. Commodification versus respecting the resources provided by mother earth for all. And so you see here now the fish are uh, being equated with dollars, the furs, uh, the trading, uh, a whole new concept of relationships uh, with respect to resources was introduced. And of course, some of you will know uh, right now, uh, the East Coast, uh, the, 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 the challenge, the fight for, for rights to fish uh, are being ignited into a potential huge battle between indigenous peoples and other fishery associations. And in the context of that, the federal government's response has been inadequate to deal with something that uh, spans um, 19 years since the Marshall uh, um, decision, which um, moved towards recognizing indigenous peoples had rights to their own resources on their lands. Uh, so we see the threads of this energy impacting our present day relationships with indigenous peoples and impacting negotiation of, of uh, uh, a way forward. Um, and of course, at Shaudia Victoria Island, we see 
uh, elements of that same struggle. The consequences of the, the arrival of the newcomers and the transformation in the lives of indigenous peoples uh, meant that the indigenous peoples were the poorest and struggled with homelessness or impoverished living conditions, both on and off reserves. They su suffer significant health crises and struggle with debilitating substance abuse, fetal alcohol syndrome, fetal alcohol effect, experience the highest youth suicide rates, struggle with unemployment, both on and off reserve, have more single family, uh, single mother families, and suffer rates, high rates of sexual, physical, and mental abuse. Now, if I'm saying we were uh, documenting this history in this PowerPoint presentation in about 2008, um, 12 years later, and even despite the uh, wake up call of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, very little has changed with respect to the poverty, the suicide, the unemployment, the despair that is such a huge part of the life of indigenous peoples. But I wouldn't want us to just think that that is all indigenous peoples are about because it traps us into um, uh, a certain notion that they are victims and they are much more than that. But nonetheless, I say, um, while this is the reality for the first peoples in this country, then none of us can look at ourselves with any self-respect until those kinds of issues are addressed holistically. So the, the, the image over there, the image is from one of the um, uh, uh, sessions Grandfather Commander and I um, joined in um, Lac Simon, uh, a native community uh, in Quebec. And uh, here you see the children writing messages about the drugs in the community, about uh, needing uh, items for school, uh, expressing really despair at, at the, 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 the kind of life that, that they were facing themselves through. And a few months later, when we actually drove through that area again, this uh, resource room had been burnt. So that's how, how uh, the despair had, had grown. And this is why I really actually remain uh, passionate about indigenous work and this legacy of Grandfather Commander, because there's a lot of un, unfinished business that we need to attend to. Uh, we've heard over the last few years a great deal about the residential schools and the abuses um, um, and, and the, the sad legacy of, of that uh, heritage. And even as people over the last uh, uh, decade have uh, been engaged in the truth and reconciliation discussions, have shared their stories, still we haven't moved to a, 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 an energy of healing. And in fact, we've really opened many wounds from Native people. Right now, the, the discussions are about the uh, people engaged in, in day schools and how the, the work, uh, how the work addresses their issues. So many uh, generations later, so many years later, this is a, a raw sore. And uh, I'd say at this point, we, you know, uh, most of you know that we hosted many gatherings at Grandfather Commander's home. Many people participated and attended over the years. And uh, some uh, French women lawyers from Quebec City developed a wampum project. And they, uh, uh, during the Truth and Reconciliation period, brought indigenous elders to groups of people to share their stories. And I went to one session uh, on the other side of the border in, in Hull, in, in Gatineau Hull. Um, City Hall. And, um, and the person who was presenting was there with his wife. Both of them had been in the residential school in Valdor. Both of them had been abused by the uh, religious orders. Uh, they married. Through their marriage, they had many struggles coming to terms 
with the abuse and its, its uh, uh, dirty fingers on their marriage. They had children. It was during the course of grandfather's gatherings that the people reclaimed their language, reaccessed their spiritual ceremonies, began to do healing sweat lodges, supported many people through, through this uh, process. And uh, much of that work was um, uh, ignited in the late 90s, this reclamation of healing practices of indigenous peoples. But much of this work was also thwarted by government. And uh, on the day that this couple were making their presentation, um, their son had committed suicide. Uh, so the ramifications continued. They still attempted to do the bridge building and the sharing. But when I look at the, 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 the present day realities, it is really shameful that people have sacrificed so much and shared so much and still don't see a way forward really on, on any local and, and national stage. Uh, this then is another part of the uh, ramifications on the life of indigenous peoples. Here's the story of uh, Donald Marshall Jr., a uh, 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 strong uh, partner with the Circle of All Nations work. And many of you may or may not remember this anymore, that the, the Marshall name came to life because he uh, challenged the injustices of the justice system. He was incarcerated for 11 years for a murder he hadn't committed. And he himself found uh, the actual murderer. There were two justice inquiries before his uh, name was exonerated. But the case that I mentioned earlier, uh, the Marshall decision of 1999, related to the fact that he went eel uh, fishing in his community. And, uh, and then was, uh, was charged um, uh, uh, for fishing and uh, ended up challenging government on that score. So he's become really remembered much more for this legal uh, decision that impacts many in, in negotiations into the future. But people forget the thread that he had revealed through his story, the injustices of policing, the court system, the prison system, and the retaliation was uh, the, uh, the charging him for fishing. So it's that kind of attitude that doesn't ever seem to end with our system. Anyway, so the, then, then so we remember Donald Marshall for that, the justice and also for the indigenous uh, claiming, reclaiming of rights. But he was passionate about youth, the youth who were committing suicide, the youth who were engaged in substance abuse, the youth who saw no life of hope, uh, restricted as they were within their communities, uh, with education systems that didn't really serve their cultural needs. And so, um, the other thing that we've forgotten about his heritage is his work for young people. And I don't know if any of you follow our Circle of All Nations work, but on, on the 13th of September, we acknowledged Donald Marshall's birthday. And uh, we did a Circle of All Nations Facebook live video, focused really, really on his story, but really much more on his story about youth his passion for hope for, for Aboriginal youth. And we presented a documentary on his cultural camp to uh, return Indigenous youth to their traditions, to their land, to the teachings of the elders, to strengthen them, to find themselves, to help them find themselves. Unfortunately, that was an initiative uh, too supported by the government, the federal government, the Department of Justice, and it was not able to continue the work in an effective way. So that was another stalled hope of indigenous peoples, much like I say, uh, the elder who uh, participated in the uh, truth and reconciliation effort. His hope for bridge building was stalled by institutional structures that don't allow for, for the, the, the true equality to emerge. Uh, uh, 
so this is one, one of the reasons why Circle for All Nations continues with its passion for child and youth care, care work. Um, I should uh, have also noted that uh, Donald Marshall Jr. also received a Wolf Project Award in 2000, was at Grandfather Commander's Millennium Peace Event at uh, Nepean Point. And uh, he received a Wolf Award because despite the oppression, he engaged in the Aboriginal Justice Learning Network effort to build bridges between police, lawyers, judges, um, uh, government officials, bureaucracies, as well as indigenous elders, women, parolees, prisoners, to forge a new way forward. So he had to really learn and, and swallow hard to re-engage with correctional officers. He went into a federal prison at the age of 16. Uh, so you can you know, let your imagination take you to how much of abuse this young child experienced. Nonetheless, he built those bridges. And again, he became a part of the work of Shaudia Victoria Island, the work of the Asanabka vision, um, because he began to see hope with grandfather's vision for the healing of relationships. He actually met with us, with the, the late uh, MP Paul Dewar. So he participated in high level strategic discussions to move this work forward. So again, it's another thwarting, that um, thwarting of uh, true commitment that I think will remain keeping us restless in our consciences as Canadians, because there's much unresolved work yet to be undertaken. So then uh, came the stories about all the sexual abuse uh, of Indigenous people, women and children. And uh, some of us who are not Indigenous, who have seen threads of those stories reflected, uh, oh gosh, in the revelations in Boston and uh, in America, uh, in the revelations of the people in Ireland uh, with respect to the church, uh, the uh, revelations of the German uh, people with respect to the abuses of the church. We know the pain of those sexual abuses, physical abuses remain with the victims and the victims' families. Well, um, uh, with indigenous peoples, there were no barriers to the, the level of abuse. And so here the voices talk about this kind of pain. Um, suicide uh, was oftentimes uh, a reaction. And uh, from that uh, bottom well of absolute despair, the suicide that still actually continues in the lives of uh, indigenous people, indigenous youth, indigenous men, uh, just about every day you hear, you hear horror stories of this. Coronavirus, of course, accentuates all the struggles for everybody, but including for, for, for Indigenous peoples. But uh, Grandfather Commander also reminded us that the spirits of our relatives are still with us. And this, again, is, uh, as I say, the painting of uh, Bev Doolittle, uh, um, New Mexico artist. And as I said, when I went to, 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 to track her down, when we went to Santa Fe, that's what I learned. She was no longer selling these books because she wanted to recognize something much deeper and sacred about what had been revealed to her. And she didn't really want uh, it commercialized. She wanted this, this kind of imagery to awaken people deeply and respectfully to the stories. So there then, bear, Bear spirit uh, is visible in the water. And her art suggests that the presence of the ancestors on the land is also felt by the newcomers. And so in this image, you see the, the faces in the trees, you see the faces in the rocks, and you see the startle in the, uh, the horseman. He's looking back, his horse is looking mm -hmm. back to, to, to sense what is in the atmosphere, what is in the air. And uh, with this recognition of the past, the present, 
grandfather also wanted us to, to remind, wanted to remind indigenous peoples that it was time to reclaim their heritage and strengthen their voices with their languages and their cultures. So when he um, made a presentation at the first United Nations event, the Cry of the Earth Conference in 2002 in uh, New York, he spoke entirely in Algonquin. Now, Grandfather Commander, as you know, spoke French, English, Algonquin, and all those dialects across the country. But he, he purposefully spoke in Algonquin and had himself translated to plant indigenous languages on the global stage. And in that uh, context, he told me many, many times, Romola, my language is so vast. It's such a land-based word. Uh, that, that notion of the vastness of his language. His language held so many thoughts and ideas beyond which smaller languages like English could manage to comprehend. And we know English is uh, a language of the world now because it's easier to understand and easier to learn than many other languages, but his language was that vast. Now, if you imagine with a language go ideas, go concepts. So as a language disappears, so do certain concepts disappear from our thinking. And I think this is partly why um, people have not understood really well enough the vision for Asinabka. And that is as much the, the, uh, the developers who have challenged it, the, the governments who have had limited understanding of the hugeness of the vision, as well as allies who have supported threads of the vision, but haven't understood the vastness and the interconnectedness of the thinking that, that contributed to this, this vision developing. Everything is about energy, grandfather said, and you need the right energetic nuances to move things forward. Some of that energy is held in the language and held in the culture. Uh, so together with, with his efforts came the vision to create a circle of all nations, a culture of peace, such as we had had it before. The seeds of this idea were already there in his work in 1967, because Grandfather Commander was a historian, as I said before, he was a politician for many years, and he um, actually created the energy for the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement that um, uh, later uh, ignited uh, America, ignited South Africa, ignited other uh, leaders. But in the 40s, it was the indigenous peoples and grandfather who took that voice for indigenous uh, presence on the land forward. And in 1967, when Canada was preparing to celebrate its 100th birthday, he hosted a gathering in Eganville to actually um, an international gathering because he had people from the States there as well to in fact affirm an indigenous welcome. And ironically, he actually had uh, the president from Weyerhaeuser, uh, uh, a former face of Pillsbury Doughboy, Domta, uh, participate in that effort. So this effort to create the Circle of All Nations, this culture of peace, um, goes back over many, many decades. And over the last 20 years of his life, um, the, the work took, uh, the circle work took on formal images such as our, our Circle of All Nations logo. But the seeds of that type of momentum had already commenced quite a while. So over the last 20 years, when he spent so much of time 15 years solid on the Asanabka vision. Um, he was building on threads. And, and again, much like with Donald Marshall Jr. and much like with the elder Moise, uh, the disappointment in the end that nothing could get through the mentality of the people who were controlling his land became uh, a moment of despair. And I say, you know, not so much despair as his resignation. Because when the last visit the Grandfather Commander made to Victoria Island in, in, on June 21st, 2011, he really spoke only in Algonquin. And uh, though he engaged with his friends who joined him at the car, he mostly spoke really to the land, it would seem. 
and I'll come back to that point later. So he said, his ancestors wanted it. His ancestors had welcomed the newcomers, but they wanted us to occupy our rightful place on Turtle Island. And we have to regain the strength that comes with reconciliation with water and earth. Hence, the, the prayer for the Ottawa River, the prayer for the water, the prayer for environmental stewardship was uh, uh, the, the deep, deep significant part of grandfather's work because he saw in the reconciliation with the land, that would be how indigenous peoples would regain their own strength. And of course, when you see them battling as they do with the pipeline issue, the fisheries issue, with the uh, nuclear dump site at, uh, in, um, in Northern Ontario, you see in indigenous people struggle to reclaim connection with even a few sacred parts of the land, even though so much else is occupied by the rest of us, and even those uh, are thwarted. The Shaudia site uh, was a sacred spiritual meeting grounds of the ancestors, and they were not separated by borders. So here's this famous uh, um, composite picture really, because it's showing elders with uh, indigenous peoples uh, 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 dressed as, uh, as reflective of different tribes, different groupings, praying at this traditional meeting place, this uh, Pandora's box for place. This uh, was originally actually a part of an NCC uh, little booklet. So the NCC knew this part of the history uh, quite a few decades ago as well. Um, the people of Pakanawatik, the uh, legendary Algonquin chief of the ancestral uh, grounds at Lake of Two Mountains, carried the seven fire uh, prophecy wampum dog. So this is grandfather command as great, great, great grandfather. So a wooden, carving, and I don't know, most of you knew grandfather, you'll, you'll see a, a remarkable similarity in the appearance there, or at least I do. Okay, so the bell tells us that um, uh, this is now the time for the lighting of the eighth fire. And uh, of course that was 12 years ago. The ancestors are drawing us back to the sacred site and uh, these were some of the stories from that time period, 2007. Uh, uh, we are beginning to uncover the bones at the Scott paper plant and things like that. Of course, uh, with respect to the Victoria Island Asanabka vision in 2014, uh, the uh, face of the ancient people revealed themselves again in their artifacts. And we had hoped that that would uh, allow for a, a, a reconsideration of the vision uh, with respect to this actually being a part of human history as a Paleolithic site. Uh, but of course that came to, to, to nowhere. Uh, so the wampum bell tells us now that it is time for their messages to resound. And of course, so the wampum sharing was very much a part of grandfather's hard work during the last uh, uh, 15 years of his life. It's time for us to rekindle the sacred uh, fire of peace and harmony between nations. And so this birch bark uh, uh, etching uh, we did was presented uh, when grandfather received the key to the city of Ottawa on Victoria Island on June 21st in 2006. And you see then in 2006, this vision for a meeting place for all the world, for uh, a place of love in the heart of the nation, a sacred space for this Jinawi uh, Daganuk reconciliation. The um, uh, Douglas Cardinal Indigenous Center, a vision for the TP peace building, eco peace uh, center, where there would have been place for uh, the brainstorming of ideas of peace activists, of environmental folk, uh, guarded by the energies of the land, guided by the natural uh, laws of life, such that uh, the hope was we wouldn't reach a stage where we'd have 
new words uh, in our language, in our, in our discussion. Now, climate change has become a common word, but it's only over the few, last few years that it has occupied us. You know, when I first went to, to Carlton and I studied geography, I discovered that um, uh, till the late 60s, there was no such word as environment being used. Uh, so these concepts have emerged with the times. A few years ago, we were really uh, talking about the, um, uh, the weather changing and the pollution. We talked about sustainable development, but really right now we're into climate change, extreme weather, and really the, the, uh, the reality that we'd hope people would have been brainstorming so we'd have better solutions that we have at the present moment. A historic interpretive center the, the, the show and tell sessions that Hydro has been doing there actually come from the Circle of All Nations vision, which was also giving place to the, the present day history of uh, Canada, the history of the last couple of hundred years. So it was not eliminating the place of, uh, of modern times from the ancient site. We would have liked to have seen power grounds uh, right across the Shaudia Bridge uh, so that Native people could have shared their dance, their spirit, their music, and also be able to share their arts and their art, uh, handicrafts and, sh and uh, you know, in that informal uh, exchange uh, right there in the city so that they need not have been excluded, so that they need not only be the Native people approved by government programs uh, uh, where uh, the art is uh, condoned by, you know, bureaucrats and then deemed accept, accept, acceptable. That was not the vision for the power grounds. That was a vision for people with heart, with beat and with, with them returning to place that they would have visited, their ancestors would have visited for 10,000 years. We wanted to see the Shaudia Dam undammed to the extent possible, recognizing that it had already been um, impacted considerably. The vision for that came when we hosted the Water Life Workshop in 2006, and then public at large, indigenous as well as non-indigenous people, thought we ought to protest Damta's plans for the expansion of the dam at that stage. So we did, there was a, a huge outcry over the years of 2007 and 2008, all people ignited in fire to, to, um, uh, to, to stop that. But uh, uh, via the trickery of the law, um, that wasn't entirely accomplished. And while we were sleeping during the last uh, uh, five or six years, uh, Hydro, Ottawa, and others, in fact, uh, accomplished what was part of the Domta plan of 2006. And with no consultation, in fact, further invaded the, the sacred rocks of the ancient sacred site. Um, and so, yeah, the vision for reconciliation with Mother Earth, with indigenous peoples and with all others, uh, which was the dream for the fire of peace and harmony was in fact uh, stunted. The vision for Victoria Island was for a place of healing reclaiming our spiritual and cultural heritage, such that we would then be reconnected as we were in the past. Um, and from the indigenous voice, we shall reach out and share our heritage and our reverence for Mother Earth with all newcomers who now inhabit Turtle Island, Mekinak, And this then is our uh, reframing of the birch bark image in, in, a, in a graphic design that, that talked about the core vision uh, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the site. And that core vision was developed with the elders in 2003. So it's well nigh 20 years old. And then all the other elements that, uh, that we've discussed. So what we had seen there at Shadia Victoria Island was the idea of a city park. Uh, so that it would be a place of sanctuary, return people, to the energies of the, the falls and the sacred river, but also replanted, perhaps with trees from Kew Garden, 
with the indigenous trees of North America and uh, serve as a sanctuary to build between two of the solitudes, the solitudes of the French and the English, but also to see the presence of indigenous. Uh, uh, um, yeah, and of course, as, as we are now becoming uh, a global society increasingly stressed with uh, mental health and physical health challenges, many people see even more the need for places of sanctuary. Our ancient indigenous values of respect for Mother Earth and all her creatures, balance for equality and harmony will penetrate from the core to create a global culture of peace consistent with the promise of the Eighth Fires prophecy. And that then was our um, graphic presentation. Uh, we do did uh, another one. That's it. Let me just uh, close that off. Um, uh, a presentation to the National Capital Commission in 2008. And I shall, if there's a chat bar there, see if I can share the text of that presentation with you. Uh, so you'll have the verbal, uh, the ideas that were, you know, shared there. Okay, so then that in essence um, uh, was the work we did at that stage. At the time that grandfather died, the city, okay, by that stage, of course, already the National Capital Commission was engaged via Canadian Heritage to advance this vision. They uh, invested money to develop the conceptual designs by Douglas Cardinal to an, another level of readiness. Uh, much money was, uh, uh, we believe, up to 85, um, uh, million, 85 was uh, dedicated to the, uh, the vision. Much of that money got diverted to the War Museum and its work. And other things have taken place. Other fed pub public monies have been dedicated to other buildings in the sacred site. Uh, and this vision has really been basically thwarted. Over the last uh, uh, eight years, nine years, Multiple people have challenged uh, uh, aspects of, uh, have challenged uh, the uh, development plans, but in a variety of uncoordinated ways. So as much uh, we have contributed to the challenges of the Asanabka vision, as have government, as have developers, as have been the breaking down of voices. But at the same time, many, fires have been lit for the multiple elements of the vision. And so, in fact, the United Nations in 2019 declared that the uh, UNESCO Year for Indigenous Languages, we see the um, Truth and Reconciliation is obliging schools to pay attention to Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous voice. Um, the issues of murdered and missing women have been before us over the last multiple years of the inquiries. So um, uh, we, uh, you guys, uh, the Peace Festival, continue with the efforts to uh, promote the seeds of peace and uh, the city of peace efforts that um, uh, have continued. Keep fires going, multiple little fires. So in, in, in a sense, uh, the, um, the, the dream fragmented, it fragmented at a critical time. And I want to tell you guys something else. Uh, and I hope I'll get a copy of this video as well, please. So I can uh, perhaps use it uh, in some of our, our sharing. But uh, I want to tell you something else. It took me a long time before I decided to share this, but I did at our last Equinox uh, live video event. A few days before grandfather died, he woke up in the middle of the night and uh, he was praying. And when he finished his prayer, he said, they gave me a name and the name was Asayas. He went back to sleep and he woke up again. He mentioned this 
name that they had given him. And I remember researching it. I thought, what can this name be? We both did. We, we Google searched a, a Sayas, and I wrote to a friend of mine, um, and, uh, and I wrote to her again a few months later because we were discussing this name. And I, uh, we, the closest we could come to was it might have been a name of Hebrew roots, of Indonesian roots, of Indian roots, and uh, we let it be at that. And I, you know, like had this kind of like vague imagined uh, idea that, oh my goodness, maybe uh, in that troubled uh, land in the Middle East, someday uh, there'll be like a reincarnation of this energy or whatever. But a few uh, weeks ago, well, a month and a half ago, on August 3rd, it was the anniversary of grandfather's passing. And uh, I had the radio on and it, I heard this word about three times before I finally paid attention to it. And what I realized is that they were announcing the storm Isaias. And um, it was a tropical storm that hit the, the, uh, the Atlantic seaboard. It hit the Caribbean islands. It impacted with quite a huge pile of devastation in um, North Carolina, Florida, up the coast. It hit Montreal, didn't hit us so badly. We had heavy rains, but we were not necessarily as conscious of it here in the capital city as other places along the East Coast. And then a few weeks ago, in the context of geography, I, I attended a, a webinar and somebody from South America talked about the impact of the storm Isaias. And I began to realize that really um, the, the, the name that we had heard in 2011 was this one. And as uh, many of you will know, um, grandfather always talked about Mother Earth. He always talked about his relationship with his Mother Earth. And I say his peace building work was really, really to awaken us to relationship with Mother Earth and um, to introduce us to his mother so that we would respect her as she he did. And in, in, a, in a sense, his daughter Evelyn has oftentimes talked about what are we walking on? We are now walking on the earth. We are now walking on the bones of her father. We are now walking on the dust of William Commander. He is part of that earth. Now, his, his, his work uh, has always been about the laws of nature. And he, he objected to the pollution of his Ottawa River and all the waters. He objected to the endless tree cutting, the decimation of the animals, the beavers, the moose, you know. Uh, and, uh, and of course, since uh, the, the, um, the, the, the challenges of the last eight years, we've seen an increase in floods. And we saw the unprecedented flooding uh, of the, the, the Ottawa River in 2017. Uh, was actually the day that um, you know, I had participated in a University of Ottawa conference on um, anthropology conference. And we had taken a bunch of international guests to Williams Lodge in Manawaki, a way back, drove across the bridge and saw uh, cars parked there. And we realized that for the very first time, people in the city of Ottawa were actually seeing the Sharia Falls up until the time that we awakened people to the fact that we have a circular waterfalls in the city. Most people didn't actually know about it. They didn't actually see it till I sketched out the map uh, that you see there in the Birch Park. And I sketched it out in another painting at another point. Nobody really knew how Victoria Island, Shaudier Island, the falls actually looked. Nobody actually did because we only ever saw pieces of it. We saw a picture of Victoria Island. We saw a picture of the waterfalls. We did not see the whole area as a landscape. But for the first time with those floods, when indigenous people say eight rivers return to their beds, we had that devastation. I'll, I'll, I noticed the time, it's now nine. So I'm gonna speed up a little bit. In 2019, 
the floods that came again um, impacted flooding and Oka at Hudson. And um, a, a short tidbit here. I had uh, taken Grandfather Commander to a sacred site in uh, north of Mont Laurier many years ago. We'd gone there a few times. In 2014, I took his niece Daisy up there and we couldn't get up to the Sacred Vision Quest site because it was now being uh, privatized. In 2019, I took his other niece uh, uh, Lillian up there and then they were really, really uh, creating some kind of like a park or something like that. All we could see was tree cutting. All we could see was a moose hanging from the tree and we could not access the ancient uh, meeting place anymore. But when we went, when I went to Hudson on part of my research, um, I learned that the tree cutting that had happened in 2014 in this Baskatong sacred area had impacted on the flooding in Hudson those uh, six years later. So together with all the tree cutting that is happening, devastating Varangi Park in, in Quebec, me, it means that there's nothing to stop the winds. The winds blow stronger, whips up more storms. And we had that storm on um, the equinox of 2016. We had what I call the eighth fire tornadoes. Uh, to the tornado that est its way on both sides of the Ottawa River and est its way up and down across the territory. Again, uh, 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 signaling the demise really of the hydro rain. And with that, if you'll recall, uh, immediately after that, uh, we had the huge elections. Uh, we had the huge changeover in terms of the provincial government. A lot of the leadership voices, some of them who actually came from Ottawa, sort of disappeared from the scene. And, uh, and, uh, and, and some of these political things happened in the context of multiple changes with respect to the environment. Okay, of late now then, we're dealing with COVID, we're dealing with global isolation, we're dealing with a whole new level of challenge. And uh, um, I mean, I don't know, would uh, uh, a different type of visioning at Chaudia Victoria Island over the last 20 years have contributed to something other than what we see? I suppose Grandfather Commander would believe that. But the other day, you know, I had a strange dream about him. And it was almost like he was being drawn to go and do something. And it was then that I began to interpret my thoughts around Isaias a little bit differently. Just imagine a, a grandfather commander uh, with such a love for his mother earth, now being engaged in this new evolutionary process of cleanup. And this is really what mother earth is doing. So I'm gonna leave you with just uh, two more thoughts that link really with this broader idea about the vision for Victoria Island. One is I watched a, a documentary, two documentaries the other day. One was called My Octopus Teacher. You must go and find it. It's a Netflix documentary and it's about a filmmaker in South Africa who, who uh, uh, inspired really by his relationship with the uh, indigenous peoples uh, in the Kalahari, goes diving in those very, very cold Atlantic waters outside Cape Town and develops a relationship with an octopus. And in this year of swimming with the octopus, learns that really he is a part of nature. And through that comes his hope for moving out of his despair to a life of health. The other documentary was a documentary called Blue. And it talks about the devastation of the oceans. We've all heard about the plastics. Um, we all uh, know about the killing of the sharks, the, removal of their fins. We know um, the, uh, the, 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 the trawlers that are really using uh, satellite imagery to help them point to where there are schools of fish, scooping up all these schools of fish, devastating, killing them all, such that there are no new generations of fish to take the place of all the tuna that's caught all the, you know, 
And of course, we've already had this experience in the East Coast with the cod fishing. We should be awakened to, to, to these kinds of realities. But no, this documentary blue, uh, created in Australia by a woman from the prairies, no less, uh, points to all these awful things that we are doing to the ocean, including the microplastics that are impacting the growth of the zooplankton, the earliest building blocks of life. But at the same time, perhaps you've also heard about the whale who carried her baby on her back, her dead baby on her back for nine days, a process of mourning, the fact that she's not pregnant again. So I leave you with the notion that there's much that is awful and is oppressing us. And there are a few seeds of hope and those few seeds of hope seem entirely to be contained in the grandfather commander word, Jinawe Daganuk. We're all connected as much with each other as we are with Mother Earth. And we need to re reconcile our relationships with Mother Earth because she's really on an evolutionary trajectory. And unless we latch on, we're not um, going to really survive with any great ease. Okay, so there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, can you just help me with the Q&A? Are there any other questions or comments that... Uh... Uh, my, my comment is administrative, and thank you, Ramo. It was wonderful. I agree with Ian. Uh, we have to be finished by 9.30. One day needs her computer back for work. <laughs> Okay, uh, if anybody else wants to speak, you have to unmute yourself. Peter, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, first of all, th um, thank you very much for that great meditation, uh, Ramola. That was um, sort of um, a great sweep. So I'm, very, I'm grateful for that. Um, secondly, let me do my uh, peace festival thing and just say... Um, of course, there's there are other events that are taking place, um, not the usual nearly 30 as last year, but anyway, there we have, uh, there's also uh, the group of 78 is doing its uh, annual conference on peacekeeping. Uh, we have the usual Mahatma Gandhi uh, lecture on the third um, at between one and three, which is going to be on Zoom with uh, several panelists there from uh, Director of Martin Luther King in, in a research and institution, uh, somebody from the University of Oxford. Uh, that's one of the advantages of uh, you know, the current era. You can get uh, international panelists a lot uh, more easily. And uh, so that's part of the, the, the festival that's coming up. To get back to uh, our meditation for today, uh, we see hundreds of millions of dollars being spent to recolonize the, the, the sacred place that uh, uh, you and I have spent a lot of time <laughs> trying to uh, preserve. And uh, as you noted, uh, a lot of this rock, the earth has been removed. And, you know, we see the practical of a New York firm putting up 25 stories on Chaudière Island upcoming. And uh, it's, it's not heartening. But uh, we have Victoria Island, they have barricaded it in nothing. They're supposedly decontaminating, but they've done virtually nothing. And it's, it's very silent there. And uh, I have to believe it's not just the NCC that likes it that way. Um, but uh, it's also still, you know, if you like, the primary opportunity at this point for doing something and bringing something of the vision to, to fruit. So I'm asking uh, Romola, where do you think at this point um, effort can be made to ensure that the the rest of the islands uh, are not completely submerged in concrete. Um, 
really, I yeah. think uh, the global realities of uh, coronavirus, the demise of the economic uh, system such as we uh, have it now, uh, the incapacity of uh, leadership really to see the, 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 the larger issues are going to give us a heck of a lot of other things to come to terms with uh, over the next many decades. Um, I don't know to what extent some of the, the plans that are underway over there right now anyway will reach any fruition. I'm, I'm kind of uh, anticipating things won't move as smoothly as, as folk might expect. Unfortunately, uh, uh, in, in terms of our, our the, the folk who challenged some of the development uh, uh, interests, uh, we really didn't do that very effectively, very strategically and very coordinatedly. And so we really became putty um, for those other forces to advance certain things. But unfortunately, one of the things that has uh, emerged with this has one, um, the, the uh, alignment of this sacred place, which was part of the national capital region, which was therefore place that all Canadians ought to have found home in. You know, whether you were in Vancouver, here in the National Capital Region would have been a place where you belonged. All of those things have now become part of a land negotiation a discussion. And, um, and, and, and we have unfortunately contributed to that, whether it's been via our union fights with, with some of our other challenges. Um, though folk have been on the side of support uh, the space, they haven't done it strategically well enough. Now, we've left the indigenous peoples, the Algonquin peoples, fighting at multiple levels as well. And at this stage, um, unless there's opportunity for those people to heal their relationships and then pick up the pieces, just like the, the elder Moise did when he reclaimed his language and his prayer and his ceremony to deal with the earth, unless there's some opportunity for the Algonquins to do that, I cannot see how um, uh, an indigenous center at Victoria Island can emerge with our help, you know, with the help of the non. So, so two strategic things have been lost, right? It's, we, we've lost that space as, uh, as the national capital space and all levels of government duck that one, whether it's the federal government, whether it's the, uh, I mean, the PCO, whether it's uh, Canadian heritage, whether it's Indian affairs, they, 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 they don't deal with that. You know, Lindsay Lambert has been challenging certain things in terms of land ownership. And while he, he holds really government hostage because there aren't the adequate papers uh, to, to support their case, um, he's like a, a voice uh, struggling on his own. Uh, we, we do have uh, the, uh, the traditional grandmothers following uh, with the uh, Shilkotan, uh voice and presence. But what does that do? It still displaces the Pequaknagan the, the, and the seven or eight uh, uh, Algonquin communities from Quebec in that discussion. So I think at this stage, uh, we have to pray and support the indigenous voice to come together. And if that emerges, and then if um, there, there's some recognition of the bigness of this vision, um, maybe something will happen there. But I'm uh, like Peter, I'm just thinking, you know, we've had the storms, we've had the tsunamis and nature isn't slowing down. She's given us the COVID. And uh, we also had that awful winter a few years ago, a year ago. Now, I don't know, you guys probably have heard uh, that uh, we're, we're digging even deeper under these ancient rocks to push our train through. And we are sitting on fault lines uh, for, for, you know, and, and, and I don't know, you maybe have tracked it already, but with the uh, uh, planning of the, the, the train lines along the Ottawa River uh, Parkway, one of my friends has been telling me they constantly dig holes and then they have to cover them up 
because they are hitting all those sinkholes. The, the sinkhole at the Rideau Center was just the first warning. They had to dump all sorts of concrete under that uh, uh, war museum uh, structure to, to hold the weight of that uh, thing up, you know, right across from NCC's uh, overlooking viewpoint on, uh, on Spark Street, Elgin Street corner. So, so all along the parkway, that's what they've been doing. They've been uh, hitting uh, sinkholes and they've had to close up and move someplace else. Now the plan is to go even deeper into the rocks. These are the most ancient rocks that created the earth. Um, how that might impact things in terms of uh, fault lines we're sitting on, I mean, who knows? But it's, it's sort of, I, I'll finish off with one story. You know, I used to work uh, in Saskatchewan Penitentiary for a warden, and he was uh, second. And uh, five minutes, five minutes, two minutes. And, and he did karate or judo. And one day he was arm wrestling with a friend. And his friend pushed his arm down, and Jimmy O's arm went out through his flesh. His bone went out through his flesh, but he would not give up. And, and sometimes that's the, 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 the thing that stalls us with this. You know, grandfather worked in the end to try and convince people like Domta to take a new step forward uh, because he saw that we needed the, the, um, the businesses, the corporate structure to be transforming its mentality. Now, of course, COVID is obliging many of them to. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the World Bank Organization, its tone is changing. So if those kinds of people can be influenced in this other way, Peter, then maybe they'll realize, ah, go back to a hotel conference center, go back to a training center for all those government people. People can still make living, people can still, but it's not the privatization, it's not the condo development, not the exclusive you know, devastation. It still would be a public place. So maybe those ideas can recirculate into the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ramoa. Let's give her a big hand. Um, uh, I really uh, do have to uh, call this to an end uh, because Wendy needs a computer back so she can go to work, uh, work from home in the other room. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, this has been our first return. I don't know that we're going to continue this month to month, but it's really an important topic, Ramoa, and I I'm hoping that there are some individuals who might want to continue the strategy of how to move the idea forward for Victoria Island. So thank you all. Uh, we got to say goodbye and uh, perhaps we'll see you next month. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for, for listening you. and take good care. Hasta la vista. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I don't... <laughs> yeah, come on. I almost turned it off. Everybody is waving goodbye, but no one is. Where are my, where are the records? Okay. Two.